camera on, not have it off. So yeah, it's really weird, isn't it? Yes, yes. I figured it out. They made it, it out. They made it not at all what the Google said, but I figured it out. Yeah, Google isn't always accurate, but no, I've discovered that it's or, it's, or it YouTube. Was, yeah, it was great when I was in high school, though. Used it all the time. And that was probably about the time I started my podcast. You were in high school. So. It's possible. It's possible. It's been 16 years. And yeah, you were actually probably in elementary school. 16 probably. years. I'm kidding. <laughs> so. I, I wish I had started listening then. I would have felt like I would have gotten in the loop faster, you know? Oh, uh, you'd have been like, who's this old guy talking about diet stuff? Weird. I probably would have gotten into it. I was into that stuff growing oh, up. Oh, were you? Okay. You're yeah. one of those kids. You were one of those kids. That's cool. That's cool. Well, thanks for redoing this. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I did five interviews before I left on my uh, Christmas break, and three of them just magically disappeared, and yours was one of them. So uh, <laughs> had you slated for next week, and I'm like, no, that was such a good interview. But all the ones that I've redone, you're the last one, have been better the second time around. So I'm, I'm excited. Cool. To get the better on camera. So plus I have my nice little background. And I'm, I'm ready. It. So and you got a nice background. I love the ambiance of your room. I'm trying. I'm trying to build it out. You know. Yeah. It is quite zen. So, all right. Well, let's get this show on the road. You ready? I'm ready. Today, guys, we have Ryan Brown. He is Ryan Mitchell Brown over on Instagram. Go check him out. R Y A N. M-I-T-C-H-E-L-B-R-O-W-N. He is a health coach and he helps people uh, with disordered e eating because he himself is a survivor of that. We're going to talk a lot about that here today. He's nutrition certified as a health coach. <laughs> I love how you put, I'm a wannabe Stephen Colbert. I know what that means. And, so <laughs> mm -hmm. and then you like to tell powerful stories through visuals and video and you got all kinds of little uh, things that you do and, and funny faces that you make on your Instagram page. So welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, man. It's, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good second round, round two uh, yes, on the yes. Jimmy Moore show. So, I'm, uh, I'm, referring I'm to you guys, he's referring to, uh, we recorded this a couple months ago on Instagram live and I went away on the Christmas break and came back and went, where is the Ryan Brown interview? I couldn't find it. So, so second round, uh, uh, they say third time's for charm, but we're going to make second time for charm today. Exactly, exactly. But dude, like you've got a story, you're a young guy. How old are you? I'm 25. So 25 years old. I guess that's officially like an old Gen Z. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. I'm, sur I'm surrounded by, now I'm surrounded by children that I don't even understand. Yes, so I'm getting there. I'm getting. I'm. I'm beginning to understand what what you guys probably perceive us as. Well, and, then, and you're, you're two generations from me. I'm in the Gen X, uh, and my best friend Brittany, who's turning thirty this year, she's young millennial, and then you're old Gen it. Z. So yeah, it's it's fun to kind of see how the different generations interact. And look, I get along with everybody. I I kind of act a little. Me too. See myself. So. <laughs> Me too. And I and I have some Gen X in me. You know, I was raised by I actually was raised by my my dad's actually a boomer. So I, I was I was raised by a boomer. And so I feel like I have an appreciation for for the older generation and and the younger generation. So I, I've kind of been able to find that balance, which I think is important if we're ever gonna get along. <laughs> Absolutely. Like I don't even I don't even like relate to a lot of my fellow people my age. It's so weird. Like all my best friends are in their 20s and 30s. Yeah, and I, I think that's by virtue of what you do. I mean, like even just just the topics you talk about are on some some level cutting edge. If you you know when you when you take it away from the mainstream, and you've been doing this for like 16 years, so you've been you've been ahead of the curve before the curve existed. <laughs> so we created some of the curve, and so yeah. <laughs> Well, I appreciate, yeah, you're a super fan of mine. I appreciate the support you've given me. But let's talk about you today because you do have quite the story uh, with the disordered eating. And I definitely want to get into that aspect of your story and some of the maybe non-conventional ways that people can implement. Uh, but we'll go all over the place. My, converse, my style is very conversational. Uh, I just like having story. And we'll talk about Gen X, Gen Z if you want to some more. So yeah. let's start with your story. Um, 
Did you have health issues? Did you have any other issues besides the disordered eating, which I want to hit hard, but were there other things that you dealt with? Were you ever fat? Did you ever have health problems? So, no, I was actually quite unremarkable as a child uh, from a medical perspective, which I suppose is good because I hear all of these stories for people that have uh, a lot of autoimmune diseases or people like Michaela Peterson who their entire life, or Rebecca Farmer is a good example. Rebecca, big time, yes. But um, I had a pretty unremarkable childhood. I had um, an amazing, loving family, probably. I mean, I was, we were the fun house. So everyone would come over. My parents would give you the soda pop that your other mom and dads wouldn't give you. We had all the candy. We had the Mountain Dew. So not necessarily the healthiest, you know, environment to grow up, but but it was very relaxed and and filled with love. And so uh, it's it's kind of interesting when I look retrospectively on on my eating disorder, which I developed about seven years ago at the tail end of high school. Uh, it's 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 interesting because in a sense I always think about how I've always felt this inner desire and maybe this is just a, a a gen x gen z whatever gen z thing where this you have this desire to be seen and i remember when like social media first started coming out in 2006 7 with youtube and i was i was on the platform there i was i was uploading youtube videos immediately when it came out and i i, I i'm kind of a camera slut i like being on camera i hey, like look, you're talking to the guy that does four podcasts a week i go really? on camera with my eye spaz, I make reels from those. Vi- like, trust me, we are brothers from another mother is what we are. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because I feel like I always felt like my story was too boring. Everyone that's been yeah. great has a really, they come from some sort of traumatic past or some sort of hardship that they did through. And I had a really easy childhood. I pretty much got anything I ever wanted as a kid. I was very spoiled on, on a lot of senses. and um. I feel like my eating disorder kind of came out of my own manifestation for a need to overcome something, which sounds kind of weird, but that's kind of what I I think of it now, seven years past that as. It's Um, It's not weird at all because if everybody around you is that video whore, as you kind of Uh, defined it, and they want attention, the reason they get the attention is they have a story. Uh, I had to overcome childhood trauma. I had to overcome a weight problem, had to overcome health problems. They all have these things that make them in their minds relevant. Mm -hmm. And so for Ryan, I'm pretty boring. My parents love me. They feed me junk food and I don't get fat. And what's my story? And so it's a wonderful theory that you have there as to why the eating disorder began. You needed a story. And it's kind of weird for people to like consciously think about that. Come on, dude, you had a great life. You're living the life. But I don't think they realize the power of the need for a story. Very true. I mean, we grow up watching movies. I mean, social media is even more intense. And we just see constant story all around us. And we kind of want to live in that in that fantasy, in a sense. I did have like some childhood trauma. I moved around a lot as a kid, which yeah. did definitely impacted that aspect of, of me developing and trying to create right. control because eating disorders are all about control. And for me, it manifested out of actually me trying to improve myself. I was trying to actually become fit when I started developing my eating disorder. I had some, I, I just went through a really bad breakup um, right before. And so I think that was kind of my, my domino that, that broke the camel's back. The catalyst, yes. The catalyst. But it was sort of a thing, like I mentioned, with the with the building a story that I think had been developing since I was a young teenager and I started getting into social media. Yeah. And so I think that's really when it began. I always used to tell my story and say it started when I broke up with my girlfriend and my life kind of fell apart. Yeah. But really, it, it would it was building for the almost 10 years prior to that. So I'm curious about the social media aspect because there is debate in society about the impact of social media. Uh, I know they did a study on Instagram and how all of these, especially young girls, teenage girls, that they find their worth in this and that when they're when they're on there, they have to find their worth in it and anyway. So there's this move to kind of ban kids 18 and younger, uh, under 18, from being on there until you're an adult so that's at least psychologically at 18, 
you're somewhat ish ready compared to say 12, 13, 14, when a lot of these kids are on there and they're having to be validated that way. Do you think that contributed somewhat to your spiral that got you to the eating disorder? Well, I think social media definitely like contributed to it. Maybe not in the sense of I was watching people and I was like, oh, I want to be fit like you or it, it actually had nothing to do with that. It was more of just like, I think for me, it was specifically around story. Um, but I don't think that's the correct approach to just straight up ban people. It's kind of like when they tried to ban alcohol entirely in the 1920s. Yes. And that didn't work. Or, I mean, think about it this way. We have to be 21 to drink or, I mean, right. yeah, drink. On how many people do you know started, well, you know, had a drink before they were 21? They legally drink at 21, but almost all of us had some before yeah. that. Yes. So I think of it like that. I don't, I think it's kind of like trying to put a Band-Aid well, on the problem. Pandora's box is already open. You've already yeah. given kids a taste of social media. I don't think very young kids should be on there. It may be yeah. pre-adolescent teens, but again, there's an argument both sides. But it's already out there. And people are already on there and kids of all sorts are on there. And that's a parental thing. If the parents are fine with them being on there, so be it. I know I know a lot of parents my age and younger uh, that they don't let their kids on there at all because of the predators that are out there. It's just a it's a sick world we're in now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's truly up to the way we raise our children. Yes. And, and instilling in them certain values. And I think it's really more about creating the correct conversation around social media and less about anything black and white, but we don't operate like that. We, we like the fast answers. Yes. Especially now, so we need it. We, we always search for a black and white answer. That's why modern medicine kind of sucks when it comes to chronic conditions, but it, it's just too nuanced. And I think it's more about creating the correct conversation about it and instilling the correct values our, with, our, with our kids that right. are going to lead them to using social media as a tool rather than a detriment. Well, you so said- a balance. Well, you said your parents were really good and and that's wonderful. What was their position about social media? Because they had to have noticed maybe some behavioral changes that were created in you. And especially after your breakup with the girlfriend, uh, they had to see this distraught teenage kid. Um, did they say anything? Did they notice? I think they knew after we moved a few times that it was hard on me, specifically the last move that we that we did. Um, but I, I don't think they really, I mean, my, I talk to my parents about this all the time. They, my dad specifically, nobody really noticed how bad my eating disorder was yeah. until I was already deep in, and I was living at home at a time I was going to college and I was just commuting. No one actually knew how bad my eating disorder was until they saw me like basically getting, uh, I think I had my shirt off or something. My dad saw me and I was like all bones Yeah, and he really never noticed it because he, I mean, everyone's so stressed just working a nine to five. Yeah. I think he's just trying to hold everything together. Yes. And, and it just, it didn't hit him till then. Yeah. You know? so, and I hit it too. I was hiding it. I wasn't like trying to get attention. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I mean? it, it's a hidden thing. So was it anorexia? Was that the yes. eating? Yeah. Yeah. It was anorexia nervosa and I had a touch of orthorexia. So I was really addicted yeah. to like going to the gym and, yeah. and, and everything was about being better. It actually wasn't, I think a lot of eating disorders, um, I mean, it's all about control, well, but, uh, but, but for me, I thought I was being healthier. Like I, I legit your, thought I was being healthy. Yeah. In your mind, you can rationalize it and say, oh, well, I'm not allowing myself to become obese because I know if I'm bigger, that's going to cause me problems down the road. So you can rationalize it. You yeah. can rationalize it. Orexia, which, by the way, those of you that don't know that term for eating disorder, it's where you're so obsessed with being healthy that uh, and and in the gym kind of going crazy in the gym. But in food, it's yeah. people that say, I must have grass fed beef. If it's grain fed, it's going to harm me. And it's like when you get to that level of obsession, it is an eating disorder. Totally. Let's not talk about some people in the community that talk about that, that say that those things. I, but, but I agree. That's okay. I don't mind stirring the pot a little bit, but there are people in the keto and carnivore community that, yeah, they they get so obsessed about it. And and look, my philosophy is if you want to do those things and you like doing those things and you get the benefits from it and you can afford it and all the things, go for it. But don't yeah. make this, if you eat grain-fed beef, you're going to keel over and 
I'm just like, no, like, let's make it inclusive, not this, this. Exactly. The, uh, I we, did you go keto and thought you had to give up wine? Well, let me introduce you to Dry Farm Wines. It is the world's first sugar-free alcohol that is lower than your typical wines. Organic made at local farms that do it the right way. Most of the wines that you buy are from three really big companies loaded with additives and preservatives. So many dozens of those kinds of things. You don't want all that junk in your wine. So go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and they will ship you these wines. And just because you listen to this podcast, Dry Farm Wines is going to give you a bottle in your first order for just one cent. Go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and uh, you will get your bottle of wine for just one singular penny. Go check them out. Dry Farm Wines, you guys. It's wine o'clock somewhere. Let's go get some wine. I mean, you know this. I'm sure you talk about it a lot too, is we see it in this mission to educate the, pe the, the people that don't know. We, we somehow turn into this bubble of only, we're an echo chamber of only speaking to ourselves now. We're not getting yeah. the larger message out that's more important. And this is like the same thing with mental health. Mental health has been really big. I mean, you, I love that you've been so open about, about your mental health journey because it's so imperative to, to just general health at all. Yes. But, but I think people have made it, especially over the last two years, this thing where it's all, all here when, when it's really a cohesive full body Yes. experience. Yes. And so I really discovered in my eating disorder journey, because when you go through standard of care, they're really all about all foods fit. You need yeah. to eat, you need to eat, you need to challenge your paradigm, eat, eat foods that scare you. And I, and I'm, I believe, by the way, I'm, I'm all for like challenging your mindset. I don't think anyone should fear like crackers and cookies. I right. think that's the wrong way to look at it. But I also should think if you're in a really, I look at eating disorders as, as similar to other autoimmune or neurodegenerative conditions of having brain inflammation. You, you have stuff going, you're just inflamed in here. And you're just not, and for me, it gets worse because when you're undernourishing yourself, you can't think straight. Like you're, you're literally not being logical no matter what you say, because you're not feeding yourself. And, that, and to me, the solution to getting out of that state when you're so nutritionally deprived isn't to eat copious amounts of pasta and cookies and carbs and then become leptin resistant and all of these problems that you develop through the normal, through the eating disorder process and, and anorexia, it just, it, it, it causes the whole, it causes you to gain weight, but you don't rebound, you don't rebalance any of the neurotransmitters that you messed up getting there. And so I have a different approach to that now where it's, it's a lot of mindset work yeah. equally about focusing on nutrient density and talking about the fact that most of the foods that we are telling you to fit in this weird plate that we've designed didn't exist a hundred years ago. So it makes no sense. It's yeah. a marketing thing. And, and so, emulating what I like to call food-like disease agents, like anything that's like yeah. crap garbage, again, another phrase that I coined, <laughs> uh, because people will eat those things because it's like way overstimulated. I, I could just imagine like paleo cavemen having a Little Debbie snack cake. And oh going, boy. Bouncing Whoa! off the walls like so overstimulate them because it's unlike anything that you would find in nature in real food. And, and then once you have that, it's like a drug or alcohol addiction. You need more of it to satisfy and get the same buzz, so to speak, um, that you got from that first initial taste. I've even gone back sometimes, Ryan, just to see how things taste now. I'll just taste. I bet again. it's wild. I've had it's some overwhelming. Yeah. I had a sip of Mountain Dew about eight months ago. Yes. And I used to I used to guzzle two liters. Like we would be we would go to Walmart and we'd they had great sales. They're like seventy cents a two liter. Right. We would get twenty four of them for a week, and we would drink one like one a day probably as yeah. a family. And I tried that thing, and it it was insanely sweet. I yeah. it, it was actually off putting. Coca Cola is that way for me. I used to drink back in the day. Uh, 16 cans of 
like full sugar, full <laughs> high fructose corn syrup Coke. He has 16 cans. That's a wild. And I had one, or uh, yeah, I had one about a two years ago, I believe it was, just to kind of, okay, what's it taste like now? And I like, as soon as it went in my mouth, I was just like throwing up. It was just so gross. I'm like, how did I ever get one in, much less 16 a day? It's, it's insane. I mean, I used to be the Diet Coke guy, so I would drink like tons of gas. After my sh- after I quit soda, I went to Diet Soda, which yeah. is worse. See, it's actually sweeter. <laughs> well, and, um, yeah, it was wild. I can tell you going off the 16 cans and I went on the Atkins diet, I immediately killed all of those, those sodas. And I went on to Diet Coke, C- Coke Zero and all these other yeah. new fans that are out there today didn't exist yet. So I went on to Diet Coke. I, I had like six to eight Diet Cokes. So that was far yeah. better than the 16 Coca-Cola HFCS oh, Coca-Colas yeah. I was at. So I had an eating disorder too. It was called binge eating. And yeah. uh, I didn't realize it. It was just called normal for me. Well, and that's the thing is like, I I think more people have eating disorders than, than we like to talk about. And it's not the eating disorders in the classic sense, but if you're on the standard American diet, it's a disordered way of eating. And SAD is a, a, an eating disorder. If you're eating yeah. SAD, standard American diet, it's sad. And it's sad for a reason because you <laughs> are on an eating disorder. And, and that's never been a healthy way to, to nourish your body ever in all of human history. And yet somehow this is the predominant diet in the United States of America and in westernized culture. Yeah. I like to, I like to say that you really need to, um, I, I say eating disorders are built around intentions. What are your intentions with why you eat the way you do? I think a lot of people uh, are eating a certain way emotionally. And, and that goes for eating disorders. Like in, in restriction, it's emotional. And and I, I feel like that eating the way I eat now, which is focused on nutrient density and, and particularly low carb, high fat, because um, like hormones, you crash your hormones, by the way, going, you know, having eating disorders, even on sad I, people with all these low testosterone, like my dad, all this stuff with excess, ex, extreme excess insulin resistance. It's, it's like, it's not like a normal thing to just have crashed hormones, you know, as I mean, I think people put things to age a lot and just blame it on age, but it's like metabolism. Uh, Dr. Ben Bickman came out with a great reel the other day which was actually based on research that he had uh, talked about before, where he was talking about after 20, your metabolism is actually the same till you're 60. Yeah, I saw that. And so you can't blame aging for for that. You can blame the gained insulin resistance, which I think happens between 20 and 60, yes. <laughs> but it's not actually your metabolism. It's all the other things that you're putting on your metabolism that are yes. messing it up. And I think the same goes for eating disorders. There's so much commonality between people that uh, become insulin resistant and then people that be, that they go and become extremely uh, underweight and they can, I mean, they can develop insulin resistance too, which is interesting. Yep. That's the one. That's exactly yep. the one. And I sent that to my mom. I was like, no more. I want to hear no more of this. <laughs> <laughs> Stop blaming your genetics. It's not, it's not the genetics. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the other thing is I see people blame eating disorders on genetics where I think there are, there's a component of genetics to everything. But it's really our environment that we grow up in and surround ourselves with and the toxins we take into our bodies that I think form all these genetic, um, epigenetic, you know, things to switch on and off all the time. Because I noticed when I went high, uh, lower, lowered my carbs significantly and went pretty high fat uh, and, and moderate protein, I just became a calmer person. And I, I don't know if you've noticed that in your own healing journey. Yeah. People yeah. are just calmer. I don't, I see so many people quick to anger, you know? And- combination of things. Yes, nourishing your body well and giving your body the proper nutrients, vitamins, minerals can calm everything in the body because the body isn't in a stressed state anymore because you're giving it the raw materials that it needs to exist. But beyond that, it also encourages you to take further action. This is so, it's so wild and it's predictable and it happened for me as well, that when you change your diet and you start feeling better, you're kind of like, huh, what else can I do? Oh, intermittent fasting. Great. Let's try that. You start feeling even better. Oh, lift heavy things. Okay. Let's do that. 
and it just builds. And and as I said earlier, I'm doing this like a uh, uh, whole year of 2022 going into a 32 degree ice bath for five minutes yeah, a day. Yeah, I love Dude, it. Dude, I've done this now as of the recording of this since day 14. And I'm already feeling the effects of it. And I've been working on this for years, but like really getting in this intense, it has profound impact. And so you're always adding in new things, not because you're just adding it in for adding it in sake, you actually crave it. You need it. Oh yeah. I feel that way with red light therapy. I feel like yeah. um, I, ever since I got my red light, I do it twice a day in the morning and evening. And it just, I just feel like a whole new person or, or the sauna. Like I have, a, I have a sauna over here Thank that you. I feel like a whole new person get in and out of that. I just feel so much more relaxed and calm and just Zen. And what I love about cold therapy, like you mentioned, is it really like gets gets those like neurotransmitters like flowing. You just so you're super focused when you get out and you just Dude, feel energized. When I get in, that's the first thing I do. I'm like laser focused straight ahead. I'm focused on my breathing. I, yeah. I've done a lot of yoga too, and they always get you to focus on your breath. When you're in an ice bath, especially 32 degrees, yeah. you have to focus on your breath or you will freak yourself out. Yeah. But uh, one of these days, because I, I also have a sauna, I want to go from my ice bath to the sauna, to the ice bath, to the sauna, kind of like do a one minute in the ice bath, five minutes in the sauna, one minute in the ice, and just like back and forth. You should. Times. You should. I have heard from other people who have done that, that it just, it, the, just the sense of kind of euphoria that comes over. I mean, I get a certain sense of euphoria being in five minute ice bath, but I can imagine uh, what it's like to do that extreme. And then some people are like, wow, that seems a little weird, Jimmy, but like, it's so powerful. And yet mm. how many people take medications to try yeah. to somewhat simulate what this very simple, uh, physical thing we can do in our environment would do to change the mind. Totally. I actually used to do this on um, my grandparents had a hot tub, granted lots of chemicals in it, but <laughs> But um, they had a hot tub and they lived in northern Michigan. So we would be there for Christmas, lots of snow. We would get in the hot tub and we would jump and roll around in the snow, yes. get back in the hot tub. And you do feel, you do, you have this sense of, I, I guess euphoria is the right word for it, but you just, you're so sharp. You're very sharp when you come out of that. It's really interesting what it does to your mental focus. And you kind of, I don't know if it necessarily releases dopamine, but you just feel positive. It's oh, great. It, 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 releases dopamine for sure yeah especially you know because people are like well getting in an ice bath getting in a sauna those are stressors i'm like in doses they're not or yeah. in right doses yes it's a stress but it's a hormetic stress so it's not this overwhelmed thing and people have been trying to push me to stay in the 32 degrees for longer than five minutes i'm like guys you don't realize that's a dose that i've prescribed some people only do one minute some people do two minutes I have found for me, five minutes is kind of the dose I want to do. Maybe during the summer, maybe if it's hotter outside and I'm a little more, more warm, I can go longer than five, but I'm doing a prescribed dose that I know is going to, yes, stress my body, but not to be overwhelmed of, of doing harm. And to build off of that, I mean, it's similar for me. So because of my extended amount of time due to my eating disorder that I was in fight or flight, even after I regained, you know, to a, like a healthy weight or whatever, um, that, that continues. So for me, I do cold exposure, but I'm building myself up to where, like right now, I'm literally just dunking my wrists and face in and yes. taking them out and, and cycling. Because what if I, I've noticed when I've done it with my whole body, like in a, I filled up my bathtub with ice before, yes. ice water. Um, it's way too much. And I'm just yes. kind of in a state of shock. So yes. I, think pe I think people like have this, and, and, I, and I get it too, because I'm, I'm all like all in kind of die. It's I, it's really about the dose that makes the medicine or medicine or poison. Yeah. And I think and I think the thing that I really want to get across to people is we have so many wonderful people in this community like you, Jimmy, and me because I'm awesome. But um, we have so many great people in here. We really shouldn't be looking for what is the right hundred percent thing. We should really take bits and pieces from everybody's journey. Yes. And see what applies to us. And I dude, think we just don't do that enough. Dude, I have said that about my podcast because people are like, well, you had one person on that said to do this. Another person on said to do the opposite of that person that said to do this. I'm confused. I'm like, learn from both because yes, both yes. of them in the right scenario are absolutely correct. 
and let's not pretend like we're all lemmings, we're all exactly the same. Ryan Brown, 25 years old, metabolically you know, healthy, uh, overcome your eating disorder is far different than 50 year old Jimmy Moore, major insulin resistance, has dealt with morbid obesity and binge eating. We're, we're not the same person. So it's obvious that this, the answers across the board won't be the same. Maybe there's crossover. We both eat low carb, high fat. We both do biohacking things to help mental and physical things. But beyond that, we're very different people. Yeah, I mean, there are there are basic principles that everyone can take away from everything. Like I, I personally feel like if, if you're gonna look at diet and lifestyle, I think just looking at what your environment around you is like and ancestrally, like it's winter. There aren't, like there's no fruit out there. I'm in Utah. There's literally no fruit out there. Um, there's no vegetables either, really. Uh, it's just snow. So I mean, if you if you want to look at it that way, it, I I would cycle in and cycle out carbs. But that also depends on your. There's this big like repeat movement, where yeah. lo lots of fruit, lots of meat, and it's a great recipe for gout, I think. Yes. But uh, the my issue is with so many people. I mean, 80% of the population in the U.S. is metabolically unhealthy. 40% is obese as of 2017. And when you look at those numbers, I don't think any of those people should be really eating any fruit at all throughout the year until no. they are uh, metabolically uh, flexible. Uh, so what? I said avocado, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Definitely higher fat in that one. I enjoy a little avocado every now and then. But it's just, I mean, the, the important thing is that it's nuanced. You just got to figure yeah. it out. And that's the same thing for mental health. You know what I mean? The techniques I use may not work with you, but I think, I mean, you can take some from it, give it a try. You know yeah. I mean? So Ryan, let's go back to your story for a moment because yeah. you have anorexia. Um, what was the first time or when was the first time? It was right after this breakup you said, um, and what, what did you do? Go days on end without eating? How, how did that work? So I wanted to build, I've always been a slanky kid. I did track in high school and, and, and golf and stuff like that. I never was, I mean, I liked weightlifting, but I never got really good at it. I, I wanted to bulk up, which sounds like really weird because of me developing the eating disorder and getting going the opposite. But what happened was I was like, I'm going to do a cut and then do a bulk. Cause I was doing all this bodybuilding research and all of them do the bulk and the cut. And I didn't want to gain fat. So I was going to cut what little fat I had, which granted was probably didn't need to cut at all. Right. And I was going to cut and then start bulking. The problem was I started cutting and then I just couldn't stop. I got into this in this state of fear. Once I cut down and I realized I was too low weight, I was like, crap, I need to gain weight, but I don't want to gain weight too quick because then I'll just get fat. So then I kept cutting. And so it just became this endless cycle of, of just... And it, it was it was restriction. I was probably eating like 600 calories a day. It was restriction on top of over exercising. So I was working out maybe six or seven hours a day. Wow. I would do I would go to the gym for a few hours, do weights. I would do a treadmill there, and then I'd come home and I'd do P90X with my dad, which is like an hour hour and a half program. So it was, and I would just constantly be moving. I never sat down. Uh, it was it was just it was it was just a constant thing. And then you you get stuck. Because you know you have a problem, but you're too afraid to like do what you know you need to do to get out of it. And I was going to ask you that. How, how conscientious of the detriment of all this were you? And it sounds like you were at least conscious. 100%. On, oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. And I'm still conscious of it. Like, I'm still digging myself out of this hole and I have to fight my own inner monologue much less than I ever have. Like it's usually just like a one-off sentence, and then I'm like, "Well, that was stupid to think that." But it, but it is a constant thing because it's so easy to get comfortable. And I think people get addicted to being sick too. And I and that was it for me. I always I was like, "Oh, now I have this problem," but like if I fix the problem, then I won't have any problems to fix. A lot of people ask me, Jimmy, how do you get? Such good deep sleep. Well, there's a lot of things that I do, but one of the newest things that I recently added is this upgraded magnesium from a company called Upgraded Formulas. Go to their website, upgradedformulas.com, and you can learn all about this nano uh, technology that they use for this particular mineral of magnesium. Again, it's called Upgraded Magnesium, and it's got all the different forms of magnesium in it. 
using the nanotechnology so it gets absorbed a lot better. Guys, I have seen my deep sleep improve by as much as 30 to 40% simply by adding in this product along with sunshine exposure, darkness in the room, cooler temperature, all of the things that I always have done. So again, upgradedformulas.com is the website. Go check them out. So it goes back to that I need a story thing again. Yeah, that's that's what really got me thinking about the story aspect of it. Because I still do this sometimes where I'm like, huh, I could definitely do this aspect of my 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 daily life better. But if I do that, then I'll be better. And then I won't have something to work on. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting well, cycle. That I, I have other people in my life that... They go on a weight loss journey. Uh, one very prominent friend in my life, that's what she did. She went on a weight loss journey. I'm going to lose X amount of weight. She loses X amount of weight, gets to the finish line and goes, what now? N- now what? And she lost her way and she started flailing in her life and she didn't have that next thing, which is why I, I, I get it with the goal thing, sets yourself a goal, but then set yourself a goal after the goal so that yes. you're prepared when you get to set goal what you're going to do next and and so i've had many conversations with this person i'm talking about and and now she's got that she's like, okay i've got a goal but i've got my goal after my goal so i've got awesome. a goal to hit after i hit my goal which then i'll make another goal so you're never running out of goals i suppose and that's what really got me uh into working with clients because we got me out of my out of my eating disorder uh pattern my 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 darkest pattern was working with uh a good friend of mine who was a personal trainer and we would just, he, we'd have, we would have brunt, uh, blunt, honest conversations with no BS. He would be honest with me where I'm at. And I needed that because I feel like a lot of times, I mean, you need to nurture people that are, that are going through this mental strife, but at the same time, you can't baby them because then they never grow and right. they, they almost have an incentive to stay where they are. Yes. And I really needed that kind of kick in the butt to move forward. And so that's why I really wanted to be a coach for other people now, because I wish that I, I could have the knowledge I do now seven years ago and, and be that, that, that person for myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you were 18 when this eating yeah. disorder developed. Okay. And then you yeah. went off to college and you kept it hidden and, and all this. So when I actually, did it- I graduated college at, at like a hundred pounds. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. So- continued on for many years yeah i actually so i had i i, I gained some weight and then uh, i actually had a relapse in my in my early 20s um and then i moved to la to, to pursue my on camera dreams and uh that actually made it worse because the environment there is just not nurturing in that respect at all well so, i mean their mom is just like you wanting to to hit it big and and get in the industry uh yeah. and yeah, their desperation makes them do stupid things. Yeah, yep. That's and and that yeah, it's 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 scary. But I actually have a, I I have a love and respect for it now. I I wrote a post just on my own personal Facebook the other other day talking about how my entire life I've always looked to tomorrow, and I've never, and I've always like blamed like blamed the past stuff and got angry with the past stuff. But I never focused on the present. I never yeah. focused on what I could do today to get to tomorrow. And I never focused on the great things that I have today. And I'm finally in a place where I actually appreciate today. Yes. And and that's such a blessing. And we always need to remember it's called the present because it's our gift. Yep. It's a gift that we've been given to do with what we're going to do. And I, I know you have this philosophy. I have this philosophy. Every day is a gift. And that's why they call it the present, because Amen. you make the present what it is. And yes, be mindful of the future, learn the lessons from the past. But today, that gift is just waiting to be given. And like, if you look at it in that way, it makes you mindful of, okay, how can I maximize the impact of this present, this gift of the people around you? and yep. making the world a better place. I think you do that brilliantly with your videos, the little goofy videos that you do. It's great. <laughs> I <laughs> oh, and I it. same on my podcasts and all the things that I do. Exactly. I mean, we're all, at the end of the day, we're kind of all contributing to the same thing in, in the grand scheme, yeah. the grand scheme of developing a better way of looking at life and a better way of just living your life. And, and I think that's kind of beautiful in and of itself.
Yes. All right, let's wrap up a bow on your story because I don't want to leave people hanging. What happened cool. after relapse? Did you get back? What's? Uh, yes. Yeah, so after, after my relapse, my relapse was right when I graduated college. And um, it was it was actually kind of then I, I kind of I noticed these patterns developing again. And I really kind of doubled down on the the, the positive self-talk, positive self-talk. Um, I really actually I, 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 I was getting really into nutrition at that point. I was taking college courses on it um, and I really dialed back. I was like, I need something really, really um, specific or I need something really simple because I was getting too complicated. And I feel like many of us that are in the community get into the weeds and it's fun, but at the st- we, can't, we have to ring ourselves in every now and then to back to simplicity. And yes. so I really had to, had, to, had to unplug from all the social stuff. Yes. And this is, and that's, I think the biggest pattern I, I developed uh, in, in my recovery the second time, which was my last relapse, was finding a balance between how, how much I, I get into these topics and yeah. always making room for removal. So I have sections of my day now where I don't look at anything online and I'm just like zenning out in my sauna, taking a bath, reading a book that has nothing to do with nutrition. I like fantasy. So I, I think, I think it's about all finding that balance. You know I mean? Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So that's kind of how I got out of it was, was finding that, that teeter totter that we all got to do. Yes, dude, I have been on the similar journey uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago now. I went away on a six-month sabbatical, like totally away from all my work. I've been at this 15 years at that point. I was burnt out. I was doing seven like shows a week. It was just uh, overwhelming. Um, and I'd written seven books in seven years. It was yeah. just so much. And I, what I found was I was using the work to hide some of the pain that I was dealing with in my life. And I didn't know how to get out of it. That was my uh, disorder. I, I had work workaholicism disorder. So I get it. I get it. To an eating disorder. And it took me completely stripping all of that away for six months. I, and, and I thought I was going to go crazy. It was actually the most glorious, peaceful things happened in my life at that time. But it was just glorious and peaceful to detach myself from all that. And then reemerge in March of 2020. And then two weeks later, the whole everything in the world blew up. So, (laughs) Um, but like it was, it was so powerful that I learned the lesson of what you were just saying, get away, even within the course of your day. I went away uh, from Thanksgiving all the way through New Year's from my work. I've learned that you have to build that in because too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Totally. Totally agree. That's the one advice I would give to everyone is really examine, examine everything you do in your day and just ask why and things will become clear. Yes. So uh, what age were you when you kind of shifted into the nutrition stuff and the eating disorder became a part of your past and not? Yeah. So I was, I was 23. I just moved back from LA because I knew that was taking a toll on my mental health as well. Just the hustle culture. And I needed to slow down. Um, I, I was pretty much past my my major eating disorder tendencies, but I still had this obsessive compulsive behavior of of trying to of, of not being present and really just focusing too much on where I wanted to be, but not doing anything to get there, and then just getting angry with it. So when I moved back, I really took time to focus on my uh, just retrospectively think about why I do things every yes. day, like what is my purpose behind these things. And so when I moved back in, in 2019 to, to Utah um, and just slowed down, that's when I started getting into exploring low-carb diets because I was on Lexapro for years and benzodiazepines for a while. I was on clonopin, which was a mess because um, I would have panic attacks. So I just like sedative and knock out. Um, and, and that's where I found the low-carb way of eating for, for mental health. And that just opened up another Pandora's box of possibility in a great way. And so that's kind of when I discovered all this stuff. And look, low carb diets are a non-traditional way of dealing with an eating disorder um, that people don't think about. You're thinking, okay, well, you kind of got to get the focus off the food because the food's the problem. No, the food's not the problem. Uh, uh, correction: the food. But is when you go when when you go on a what's that? Oh, I was just gonna say when you go on a low carb diet, you you'll be surprised how much you don't think about food. Right. Anymore. Well, 
It's so funny, too, because people over the years, and I've heard it all, have called low-carb eating, keto eating, and eating disorder. Oh, yeah. Eating and eating disorder. And it's like, okay, in the wrong context, maybe, maybe somebody with an eating disorder shouldn't just jump right into fasting. Yeah, don't do that, <laughs> especially if you've had anorexia. And so, um, and same thing with keto. Don't just don't jump into keto without kind of fixing some of the mental things related to your eating disorder because keto can be looked at through the prism of an eating disorder orthorexia and you go to that extreme and so what are some of the other non-traditional methods that you use now with clients and and even you used yourself let's talk about some of those things here at the end yeah i mean some of my favorite things to do now really revolve around around uh exposures that i that i have throughout my um, throughout my day i i like to focus on a low carb way of eating just because i think it, it it's a great way to rebalance hormones and and just and just neuro neurochemistry when you're su- in such a deprived state you really need a lot of cholesterol to yeah. get all those hormones functioning correctly and also just reset your hunger hormones Yes. And getting on the carb roller coaster is not the answer to doing that. In fact, it just makes everything worse yeah. in my experience. So that's definitely like a base of of my of my of my uh, guidance with people. But I've really moved into now the amount of time we we we're looking at screens, the the amount of light we're seeing at night that can throw off our sleep. Yes. And 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 just taking more time for you. Um, I think a lot of people that are that do have eating disorders have this need when they kind of get past it to give back, which I think is great. But then they kind of forget about taking care of themselves. And I know I did this in my early early days on on social media trying to help people. I got so invested in trying to help people that I wasn't taking care of myself and I was actually being a detriment. Yes. So I try to those are some basic basic principles, I think, for for people. Look, I mean, taking care of yourself and and realizing that being kind and loving isn't just for other people. If you can't be kind and loving to you, then how do you ever hope to be that way for other people? And it's like, I know there's a big movement, the whole self-love and self-care. And look, I'm all about it. I think sometimes it's bastardized and, and portrayed in ways that I don't think are good at all. But overall... Be kind to yourself, be loving to yourself, like that calms down all the everything in your body that would cause you to be, you know, frazzled and overwhelmed that a lot of people are dealing with. So uh, being mindful of your mental health, I guess, is what. I, we're- yeah, I would say, too, if you're if you're somebody that that is, is looking to start new things, work with a coach. It, you're not going to find anything but benefit working with someone that's been there. Yeah, I know uh, my friend uh, Jessica uh, McDaniel and then Mary Roberts. They're both coaches like you, um, and they also they they call they call the eating disorder Ed because uh, uh, yep. and it's like we got to calm down Ed because Ed wants to scream in your head and da da da. It's just I it's think true. that's good imagery to give a name to this this beast. Um, and and Ed is not in control of your life. You control Ed, uh, and he's not—he's not saying hello, Wilbur, Mr. Ed. Uh, but <laughs> that's before your time. But it's before my time too. But it's funnier. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> a horse is a horse, of course, of course. See, my boomer, my boomer listeners are gonna go. See, Jimmy knows. And hey, Ryan, you got to You gotta get. You gotta catch all the communities. You gotta I get do. everybody. I do. I, I got the Gen Zers watching you today. The Gen Xers watching me. And we bring in the boomers and we're all one big happy fan. And the millennials, they watch everything. So, uh, <laughs> well, dude, this was so much fun. Ryan Mitchell Brown is who he is over on Instagram. Go check him out. R-Y-A-N-M-I-T-C-H-E-L-B-R-O-W-N. He's got a nice little link tree there that you can see his YouTube channel uh, and, and just all kinds of things that he's doing. He does TikTok. Of course you do TikTok. All, all you, all you did. Believe me, I wish it wasn't necessary. I, I feel like you got to be everywhere, so you might as well repurpose everywhere. Dude, I got on TikTok thinking, okay, I'll repurpose or I'll do my thing. I mean, when I first got on, I was so awkward 
It's like there's all these Gen Zers. They're all I can take you, man, if I want to. And I'm just like the okay, thing is, the I'm, thing is, being being you, it automatically sets you ahead because you're in a league all your own. Yeah, that's yeah. But I could never get traction over there. I know my friend Ben Azadi. He's got you know millions of views on his videos, and you probably have lots of views on yours. I, I just never got traction, so I just abandoned it. I do reels on Instagram. I love that. Reels I, are fun. They're better. Shh, don't tell TikTok. Yeah. I post on YouTube and I, I do my thing. I do I do the podcast thing. So we all have our niches and this is mine and, and you've got yours on YouTube and TikTok. But guys, go check him out. And Ryan, thanks so much for doing this all over again. This was a much better, much better interview than the first time. And the first one was amazing. Thank you, sir. It's been my pleasure. to play in the mask game me too that's why i wanted to tell you about the unmask this is a breathable completely breathable it covers you can't even see that it's breathable but it's breathable whether you're going on a plane having to go into a store and wearing this thing play the mask game.com is how you can get this mask they come in all kinds of colors and everything in fact right there you can see right through it what it is, but when you're wearing it, it does not look like it's anything different, but <sighs> it's breathable, baby. Playthemassgame.com.